Hello and welcome to the latest in the Royal Institute of Philosophy's 2021-22 series of London lectures on the theme of Expanding Horizons. Uh, we are not physically in London today, we are on the World Wide Web as we have been, uh, but with the advantage that means you can join us from anywhere in the world. Our series theme, Expanding Horizons, comes from the fact that philosophy in the English-speaking world for long years, for many years, perhaps had rather narrow horizons, according to many at least. But in recent years, there's been a lot of interest in trying to push at the borders, looking at uh, other traditions, other parts of the world, and also engaging with other subjects and questions, all sorts of ways in which uh, the perhaps relatively narrow confines of philosophy have been expanding. Um, this evening's talk is certainly expanding horizons for philosophers such as myself, educated in the latter part, the, the fag end of the 20th century. Uh, we really didn't even know how to pronounce Du Bois, let alone know anything about his philosophy, it just wasn't on the horizons at all. But thanks to people like GK, that's changing. And I hope if you're not familiar with Du Bois, then you really are going to learn something this evening. And I think like me, you're going to go go away wanting to read more. Our speaker is GK Jeffers. He's Associate Professor in the Department of Philosophy at Dalhousie University. You may know him as the co-presenter of the Africana Philosophy editions of the History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps podcast, an incredible enterprise, which is which really is covering philosophy without any gaps. And they're already on episode 94, just in the Africana Philosophy section alone. And it's going to go on probably to about 150 by the end. There are going to be books coming out of that as well. Uh, volume 1 is not too far away, covering ancient Egypt in the 19th century. Chike is also the co-author of What is Race for Philosophical Views and Listening to Ourselves, a multilingual anthology of African uh, philosophy. Before we hear his talk, I just want to take this opportunity now, I've got your attention, to tell you a little bit about some of the other talks in the series. And I'll just show you what we've been doing since Christmas. There's a whole load of talks before Christmas, and they're all on YouTube to watch. All the talks are available to watch on our YouTube channel for as long as there is a YouTube absolutely for free. And you can see that after Chike's talk, we've got three more to go in March after a week off next week. We've got Lewis Gordon on decolonizing philosophy, a, a very hot topic at the moment indeed. After that, we have Roger Ames of the University of Hawaii, one of the world's leading scholars of Chinese philosophy on zoetology, a new name for an old way of thinking. That's certainly a new name I haven't heard before. And our series is going to conclude with Janardin Ganeri from the University of Toronto, who is going to talk about Fernando Pessoa, uh, the poet as philosopher. And uh, Pessoa is a really fascinating uh, uh, think, uh, thinker and writer, and Janardin's a very interesting philosopher as well. So we've got a great end of the series, which is beginning uh, tonight with G.K. Jeffers. He's, if you want to ask a question, simple, put it into the chat. Two little requests, though. Please make sure it's, think about your wording so we really understand what you mean by your question. You'd be surprised how often it's really hard to make out what the question is really asking. And if you can, please keep it within one chat uh, little comment box so we can display in its entirety. Uh, so after the talk, we'll have that discussion. I'll have the discussion with Chike and I'll feed in as many questions from you as I can. But let's hear the talk, Listening to Ourselves, a Multilingual... Sorry, <laughs> that was the name of one of his books. <laughs> what counts as collective gift, culture and value in Du Bois's The Gift of Black Folk? Hello and good evening. I'm excited to talk to you today about W.E.B. Du Bois. The celebrated African-American intellectual and activist who lived from 1868 to 1963. Du Bois has been increasingly recognized in recent times as a philosophical thinker of uncommon depth and great historical significance. In order to appreciate him as a philosophical mind, though, there are certain essays and books that one simply must read. For example, although it is not among his most famous works outside the discipline of philosophy, his 1897 essay, The Conservation of Races, did much to stimulate and shape the concerns of philosophy of race as an area of research that developed in the last couple decades of the 20th century and the first couple decades of the present century. I will say something soon about why it has been so influential. Looking beyond essays like conservation, though, there are books, and I would single out three at least as essential 
Uh, first, The Souls of Black Folk from 1903, which is his most famous work. This is a collection of essays along with a piece of short fiction. Uh, and it was most notable at the time it was published for his criticism of Booker T. Washington, the foremost black leader of the time. But since then, it has become celebrated, especially for introducing the concept of double consciousness in order to capture the psychological conflict engendered by the experience of being black in America. Second, Dark Water from 1920 uh, features essays revealing a, a radically egalitarian turn in Du Bois's thinking and also interspersed between these essays, a set of poems and short stories making extensive, though sometimes ironic use of religious language and imagery in order to attack the ideas and structures of white supremacy. Third and finally, Dusk of Dawn from 1940, which is structured partly as an autobiography and partly as a focused study of the complexities of the concept of race. As special as these three books are, Du Bois wrote many more, uh, classics of sociology, like his 1899 book, The Philadelphia Negro, classics of history, like Black Reconstruction in America from 1935, and novels like The Quest of the Silver Fleece from 1911 and Dark Princess from 1928, as it turns out, what I want to discuss in this lecture is not one of the three essential texts or even one of the other books of his that I have just mentioned, but rather a work that has received much less attention called The Gift of Black Folk. It was published in 1924 as part of a book series on the contributions of ethnic minorities to the United States, commissioned by the Knights of Columbus, the Catholic Fraternal Service Organization. The other two books that appeared in the series were entitled The Jews in the Making of America and The Germans in the Making of America. Accordingly, the subtitle of Du Bois's book is The Negroes in the Making of America. What I wish to argue this evening is that while I have not counted it as one of Du Bois's central philosophical masterpieces, the gift of black folk is nevertheless indispensable for puzzling through some questions of fundamental importance raised by his general approach to problems of racism. Okay, section one, conservation and its critics. On March 5th, 1897, in Washington, D.C., Du Bois delivered conservation as the, at the very first meeting of the American Negro Academy, a learned society founded by his mentor, Alexander Crummel. Uh, as we reach what we might call the climax of the essay, Du Bois envisions the academy helping to generate and standing at the center of an organized proliferation of African-American institutions. Quote, Negro colleges, Negro newspapers, Negro business organizations, a Negro school of literature and art, and an intellectual clearinghouse for all these products of the Negro mind, which we, which we may call a Negro academy. Preceding this climactic point, however, and thus forming the bulk of the essay is the theoretical background justifying this practical stance. The question Du Bois sets out to investigate is the real meaning of race. He suggests that African Americans in his time often worry when encountering discussions of the nature of race because it is so common for these discussions to end up having disturbing implications about their status as human beings. There is a temptation as a result to, quote, deprecate and minimize race distinctions. Du Bois also suggests that in addition to emphasizing the unity of humanity, African Americans discussing race tend to focus on the wrongs of discrimination. He announces his, his intention, by contrast, to look at race from a broader perspective. It is necessary in planning our movements, in guiding our future development, that at times we rise above the pressing but smaller questions of separate schools and cars, wage discrimination and lynch law, to survey the whole question of race in human philosophy, and to lay, on a basis of broad knowledge and careful insight, those large lines of policy and higher ideals which may form our guiding lines and boundaries in the practical difficulties of every day. Du Bois then makes the move that has made the essay seem so prophetic to so many philosophers of race in the present. He denies that research in the natural sciences has been able to illuminate the significance of racial difference and claims we must instead take up the perspective of 
the historian and the sociologist. From that perspective, a race may be defined, according to him, as a vast family of human beings, generally of common blood and language, always of common history, traditions, and impulses, who are both voluntarily and involuntarily striving together for the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. Given this talk of shared traditions, impulses, and ideals of life, the socio-historical account of race that Du Bois offers us here is more specifically an account of races as sharing cultures. Note further that this definition of races as cultural groups is directly connected to his multiculturalism. Modern civilization, as Du Bois understands it, is the ongoing result of strivings for ideals by different groups that he considers to be races in the socio-historical sense of the term. The English nation stood for constitutional liberty and commercial freedom. The German nation for science and philosophy. The Romance nations stood for literature and art. And the other race groups are striving, each in its own way, to develop for civilization its particular message, its particular ideal, which shall help to guide the world nearer and nearer that perfection of human life for which we all long, that one far-off divine event. Given this understanding of race, Du Bois suggests that if black people fail to value their racial identity, they do a disservice not only to themselves, but to the world as a whole. They rob themselves and the world of the valuable cultural contributions that their particularity enables them to develop. Du Bois acknowledges, however, that it can be tempting for African Americans to see the cessation of any perception of them as racially different as the only hope for the coming to an end of the oppression they experience in the United States. He considers as an objection to his imperative of embracing black identity, the idea that our sole hope of salvation lies in being able to lose our race identity in the commingled blood of the nation. In response to this objection, Du Bois provides a remarkable affirmation of the reality and value of cultural hybridity. He says of his people, on the one hand, we are Americans, not only by birth and by citizenship, but by our political ideals, our language, our religion. On the other hand, he claims, farther than that, our Americanism does not go. At that point, we are Negroes, members of a vast historic race. As a distinct black African descended people, they can credit themselves, in his view, with having already greatly contributed a number of distinctive cultural contributions to America. We are that people whose subtle sense of song has given America its only American music, its only American fairy tales, its only touch of pathos and humor amid its mad money-getting plutocracy. This evidence of the ability to contribute further justifies the practical conclusion that African Americans must avoid downplaying racial difference and instead hold on to their distinctive group identity as members of the black race. In doing so, they will not replace the goal of ending anti-black discrimination with the goal of making more cultural contributions, but rather they will combine these goals. It is our duty to conserve our physical powers, our intellectual endowments, our spiritual ideals. As a race, we must strive by race organization, by race solidarity, by race unity, to the realization of that broader humanity which freely recognizes differences in men, but sternly deprecates inequality in their opportunities of development. Kwame Anthony Appiah's 1985 article, The Uncompleted Argument, Du Bois and the Illusion of Race, sparked a vigorous debate about what to make of conservation and of race in general in ways that have shaped philosophy of race as an area of study ever since. For one thing, Appiah's piece established anti-realism about race as an important position in philosophy, requiring sophisticated response from those who disagree. It begins with a discussion of how little genetic difference there is among humans, and thus how little reason there is to think that any significant biological differences between humans 
may be captured by talk of racial difference. Toward the end, Appiah quips, the truth is that there are no races. There's nothing in the world that can do all we ask race to do for us. Before that conclusion, however, Appiah performs a famous and controversial critical analysis of Du Bois's definition of a race. I should note that in I should note that Appiah has in recent years abandoned the critique of conservation expressed in the uncompleted argument, but it remains worth revisiting. It remains worth revisiting for its powerful attack on the possibility of a socio-historical account of race. Appiah investigates how each of the components of Du Bois's definition could help us distinguish between races on a non-biological basis and finds that none of them do the job. Most notably, he argues that Du Bois's appeal to the notion of a common history is circular. Sharing a common group history cannot be a criterion for being members of the same group, for we would have to be able to identify the group in order to identify its history. Appiah furthermore claims that what Du Bois implicitly relies on to distinguish his idiosyncratic list of races which, as we have seen, includes Black people alongside groups such as the English, the Germans, and the Romance nations, is really a geographic criterion. People are members of the same race if they share features in virtue of being descended largely from people of the same region. But while the shared features may be cultural, in the case of some of the other so-called races he distinguishes, as far as Appia can see, the only thing that can plausibly be seen as uniting the diverse members of the black race is a broad physical resemblance. His critique then is that conservation does not really move beyond the traditional notion of race as a matter of biologically inherited characteristics, both physical and behavioral. Rather, Du Bois elected in effect to admit that color was a sign of a racial essence, but to deny that the cultural capacities of the black-skinned, curly-haired members of humankind were inferior to those of the white-skinned, straighter-haired ones. Tommy Shelby, in his 2005 book, We Who Are Dark, The Philosophical Foundations of Black Solidarity, also takes a critical stance on conservation, but there is a big difference between his critique and Appiah's. If Appiah's main concern was that Du Bois misrepresents human reality with a biologically essentialist description of racial difference, then Shelby leads us to worry about how racial, essentialist, racial essentialism can be a source of unjustified prescriptions, even when the racial, es racial essence is supposedly non-biological. Shelby's target is thus not the definition of race in conservation, but rather what he takes to be the essay's main moral and political principle. Du Bois was convinced that a collective Black identity, based primarily on a shared history and culture, and only secondarily, if at all, on a common biological inheritance, is a necessary component of an emancipatory Black solidarity. Shelby believes this requirement of a sense of shared cultural identity is first of all unnecessary for cultivating unity among black people for the purpose of fighting racism. Secondly, he believes it is not just unnecessary, but actively hurtful. <clears throat> uh, he claims that pushing for allegiance to a common cultural identity is counterproductive to black solidarity because doing so constrains individual freedom in a way that discourages unity. If there is group pressure to conform to some prototype of blackness, which collective identity theory would seem to require, this would likely create core and fringe subgroups, thus alienating those on the fringe and providing them with an incentive to defect from the collective effort. Racial essentialism on this account ostracizes those who feel unable to identify with the chosen set image of blackness. It is therefore self-defeating in a call for black solidarity in the face of oppression. Appiah and Shelby's critiques of conservation force us to question what we ought to see as the ultimate legacy of this influential essay. 
There should be no doubt that it is a philosophical classic, even if only for the way it seeks to create space for what we today call social constructionism about race. The tougher question is how plausible and attractive we should find its vision of black cultural unity. Near the end of the first chapter of The Souls of Black Folk, and the chapter is a revised version of an essay that Du Bois published in the same year that he presented Conservation. We find Du Bois once again claiming that the goals of achieving equality and of preserving and cultivating the distinctiveness of Black culture are not at odds, but must be pursued simultaneously. He writes of striving toward that vaster ideal that swims before the Negro people, the ideal of human brotherhood gained through the unifying ideal of race. The ideal of fostering and developing the traits and talents of the Negro, not in opposition to or contempt for other races, but rather in large conformity to the greater ideals of the American Republic, in order that someday on American soil, two world races may give each to each those characteristics both so sadly lack. As in conservation, he also claims that there is a history of black cultural contributions to America preparing the way for future giving. We, the darker ones, come even now not altogether empty-handed. There are today no truer exponents of the pure human spirit, the Declaration of Independence, than the American Negroes. <clears throat> there is no true American music but the wild, sweet melodies of the Negro slave. The American fairy tales and folklore are Indian and African, and all in all, we black men seem the sole oasis of simple faith and reverence in a dusty desert of dollars and smartness. These words from souls require us to ask the same question inspired, the same questions inspired by conservation. Should we be led by Appiah to view the traits and talents of black people that Du Bois talks about here as naturally inherited, passed down in the blood, so to speak? And if not, how else should we understand them? Does the goal of fostering and developing these traits and talents place a burden on black individuals to live up to cultural standards of blackness in the way that Shelby argues is simply counterproductive? Given the fame of this book, The Souls of Black Folk, it is perhaps curious that so few read and discuss The Gift of Black Folk, as the title makes it sound like something of a sequel. So what do we find when we look for answers to the questions we have raised in the gift, as I'll now call it? Well, there is at least one passage in the book that seems to confirm rather clearly that Appiah was right. That is, that Du Bois understands the cultural uniqueness of Black people in a straightforwardly, biologically essentialist way. Chapter 8 of The Gift, entitled Negro Art and Literature, begins with this paragraph. The Negro is primarily an artist. The usual way of putting this is to speak disdainfully of his sensuous nature. This means that the only race which has held at bay the life-destroying forces of the tropics has gained therefrom, in some slight compensation, a sense of beauty, particularly for sound and color, which characterizes the race. The Negro blood, which flowed in the veins of many of the mightiest of the pharaohs, accounts for much of Egyptian art, and indeed, Egyptian civilization owes much in its origin to the development of the large strain of Negro blood, which manifested itself in every grade of Egyptian society. Note how Du Bois protests the disdain with which people talk of the alleged sensuousness of black people, but not because he wants to reject the stereotype thus labeled. It is the disdain that constitutes the problem. The concern here with revaluing what has been denigrated fits well with Appiah's descrip description of what is going on in conservation. And then, of course, the final sentence of the paragraph confronts us with a direct appeal to the power of black blood flowing through veins. So, maybe we should say case closed and simply accept that what Du Bois has to say about black culture is rooted in an outdated understanding of racial belonging, making his work of no less historical interest, but much less practical relevance. Or perhaps we should not be so hasty. 
Consider how later in the same chapter, Du Bois begins to talk about the black contribution to literature. If you know something about the history of African-American literature, you might suspect that he would begin with Phyllis Wheatley. He does, in fact, go on to call her easily the pioneer. But before that, he has pages on what he calls the influence which the Negro has had on American literature, by which he means literature by white Americans. You might wonder whether this influence is, matter, is a matter of how the special black sense of beauty has had effects beyond that which is produced by black people themselves. What we find, though, is that he is talking simply about the presence of black people and problems surrounding them as themes in the writing and oratory of white Americans. He tells a story that reaches all the way back to Shakespeare, for whom he says, presumably speaking of Othello, the black man of fiction was a man, a brave, fine, if withal, over-trustful and impulsive hero. In the context of American slavery, by contrast, he emerged slowly beginning about 1830 as a dull, stupid, but contented slave, capable of dog-like devotion, superstitious and incapable of education. Controversy over abolition made him a victim, a man of sorrows, a fugitive chased by bloodhounds, a beautiful raped octoroon a crucified Uncle Tom, but a lay figure, objectively pitiable, but seldom subjectively conceived. After the era of Reconstruction, following the Civil War, a black man was either a faithful old, before the war, darky, worshipping lordly white folk, or a frolicking ape, or a villain, a sullen scoundrel, a violator of womanhood, a low thief, and misbirthed monster. At the time Du Bois is writing, he says the black character in literature is slowly but tentatively, almost apologetically, rising. A somewhat deserving, often poignant, but hopeless figure. A man whose only proper end is dramatic suicide, physically or morally. This is a fascinating overview of how black people have been depicted in literature by white authors, and thinking generally about Du Bois as a historian, it is not surprising to see him offering us such a perspective. What is curious, however, is that we are being offered this account of how black people have influenced American literature simply by being depicted within it as an example of how black people have contributed to America. If we are to call this a contribution, it seems fair at least to say that it is not a very active kind of contributing. After all, all that needs to be done by black people to contribute in this way is to exist. And by virtue of existing, particularly within the American context, they are able to be depicted. Du Bois acknowledges uh, precisely this concern when he writes, it may be said that the influence of the Negro here is a passive influence. And yet one must remember that it would be inconceivable to have an American literature, even that written by white men and not have the Negro as a subject. He has been the lay figure, but after all, the figure has been alive. It has moved, it has talked, felt, and influenced. As a reply to an objection, this is intriguing, though not completely clear. I take him to be saying, at least in part, that the kind of presence black people have had in American literature is by itself evidence of the active part they have played in American life, even if to be written about is a passive experience. Part of what seems paradoxical about calling being written about a contribution, however, is the emphasis Du Bois places on how black people have been depicted in literature so often as caricatures they have not been merely depicted, but distorted and dehumanized. Du Bois writes, As a normal human being, reacting humanly to human problems, the Negro has never appeared in the fiction or the science of white writers, with a bare half dozen exceptions, while to the white Southerner who knows him best, he is always an idiot or a monster, and he sees him as such no matter what is before his very eyes. 
if it is already strange to think of being depicted as a contribution, then it seems even stranger to think of being distorted and misrepresented as a contribution. Du Bois continues, and yet with all this, the Negro has held the stage. In the South, he is everything. You cannot discuss religion, morals, politics, social life, science, earth or sky, God or devil without touching the Negro. It is a perennial and continuous and continual subject of books, editorials, sermons, lectures, and smoking car confabs. In the North and West, while seldom in the center, the Negro is always in the wings, waiting to appear or screaming shrill lines off stage. What would intellectual America do if she woke some fine morning to find no Negro problem? Again, Understood as a defense of treating the fact of being misrepresented as a contribution to American culture, this is not totally clear. What we can most certainly take from it is a major theme of the book, namely that America is not America without black people. That to imagine America without black people is to come up with a fiction so vastly different from what America is that it would be misleading to think of it as in any way an envisioning of America because of how central to American life, history, and culture Black people have been. This is indeed a powerful, insightful sentiment. What it leaves unresolved, however, is exactly how this acknowledgement of this centrality relates to, the, relates to promoting the goal of Black people preserving their cultural difference in order to enrich America and the rest of the world with their distinctive cultural contributions. This is why I say we should not be hasty because it is inaccurate to see the gift as simply providing a clearly essentialist answer to the question of how black people can and should view themselves as having contributed and as able to contribute further. Nowhere beyond that opening portion of chapter 8 is there so blatant an appeal to the ideal, the idea of special, power, special powers in racial blood. What we get instead is a bewildering variety of activities, experiences, and characteristics, sometimes active, but sometimes seemingly passive, sometimes complementary to Black people, but sometimes degrading. One helpful feature of the book, given the task of summarizing this variety, is that each chapter has a sort of subtitle encapsulating its content. And so I will now introduce the book further by quoting and commenting upon these subtitles. Chapter one, The Black Explorers, is summarized in this way, how the Negro helped in the discovery of America and gave his ancient customs to the land. A centerpiece of this chapter is the story of Estebanico, the enslaved black Moroccan who ended up becoming the first black person to visit various parts of what is now the United States in the 1530s. His story is an important one, but notice the difference between telling that story and speaking of, say, the gift of black music or even the gifted poetry of Phyllis Wheatley. It is not clear what, if anything, we might see as culturally distinct about this black man's role in the Spanish exploration of North America. The part about giving ancient customs to the land would seem to refer not to anything Estevanico did, but rather to Du Bois's discussion of the hypothesis that Africans visited the Americas before 1492, a hypothesis partly supported by reference to artistic forms and agricultural practices found among the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Even if accurate, and it should be noted that this, hypo this hypothesis is viewed by many, perhaps most historians today as exceedingly doubtful, there are critical questions we should ask about how contributions to indigenous cultures preceding the colonization of the Americas could relate or how they might not relate to contributions to the United States. Let us move on nevertheless to chapter two, Black Labor, summarized as follows, how the, Negro, how the Negro gave his brawn and brain to fell the forests, till the soil, and make America a rich and prosperous land. The language here is active, 
suitable to how we would think of a gift, even if not necessarily a culturally distinctive one. And yet, central to this chapter is the experience of slavery, which we obviously have much reason to think should never be put in the same sentence as the idea of black gifts. I will say more about this chapter in the next section. Chapter 3, Black Soldiers, is summarized as follows, how the Negro fought in every American war for a cause that was not his, and to gain for others a freedom which was not his own. Here again we have active language, suitable to gift-giving, and yet again we have reason to worry that compelled service will be misidentified as a gift. To the extent that we are talking about service freely and voluntarily performed, however, there, there arises the question of how we could value this as a gift, given the basic unfairness that this description evokes. Chapter 4, The Emancipation of Democracy, is summarized as follows, how the black slave by his incessant struggle to be free has broadened the basis of democracy in America and in the world. Now, this is usefully combined with Chapter 5, The Reconstruction of Freedom, summarized as follows. How the black fugitive, soldier, and freedman after the Civil War helped to restore the Union, establish public schools, enfranchise the poor white, and initiate industrial democracy in America. It is in Chapter 5 that Du Bois specifies what he takes to be the greatest gift of black people to, an Amer of black people to America. And this is an important point to which we will return. Chapter 6, The Freedom of Womanhood, is summarized as follows. How the black woman from her lowest state not only united two great human races, but helped lift herself and all women to economic independence and self-expression. You might wonder how we could ever talk of the black and white races as united before even wondering how we might attribute the accomplishment of their unity to black women. On the other hand, you might be the kind of quick-witted person who realizes immediately that Du Bois is talking about the way that the systemic problem of rape under slavery biologically united the two races. And if so, you might also be duly horrified at the idea of speaking of this as a gift. So I will, of course, again return to this in the next section. Chapter 7, The American Folk Song, is summarized as follows. How black folk sang their sorrow songs in the land of their bondage and made this music the only American folk music. This chapter is, in one way, relatively uncontroversial for our purposes, as it fits well with the idea of a distinctive cultural gift, what we find in conservation. But it is thus also questionable how much it advances our nature, uh, advances our understanding of the nature of black gift giving. Chapter 8, uh, which I have already discussed at length, is summarized how the tragic story of the black slave has become a central theme of the story of America and has inspired literature and created art. Finally, in chapter 9, The Gift of the Spirit, we find the summary, how the fine, sweet spirit of black folk, despite superstition and passion, has breathed the soul of humility and forgiveness into the formalism and cant of American religion. The opening paragraphs of this last chapter of the book are relevant to how we judge the seemingly blatant essentialism that we found in chapter 8. And so these are worth discussing. So Du Bois writes, above and beyond all that we have mentioned, perhaps least tangible but just as true is the peculiar spiritual quality which the Negro has injected into American life and civilization. It is hard to define or characterize it. A certain spiritual joyousness, a sensuous, tropical love of life in vivid contrast to the cool and cautious New England reason, a slow and dreamful conception of the universe, a drawling and slurring of speech, an intense sensitiveness to spiritual values, all these things and others like to them tell of the imprint of Africa on Europe in America. Du Bois's admission that he is dealing with something real but hard to define, hard to characterize, barely tangible, is interesting as a reflection upon the difficulty of precision 
when dealing with such aspects of culture as general style, common mannerisms, and so on. But how is this influence transmitted, according to Du Bois? He writes, one way this influence has been brought to bear is through the actual mingling of blood. But this is the smaller cause of Negro influence. Heredity is always stronger through the influence of acts and deeds and imitations than through actual blood descent. And the presence of the Negro in the United States, quite apart from the mingling of blood, has always strongly influenced the land. We see here that Du Bois treats it as indeed possible for biological reproduction to pass on cultural characteristics, but also that he strongly believes this is not the primary way in which black cultural influence should be discerned and measured. This is reminiscent of his claim in conservation that, that race is more social and historical than natural because racial difference generally involves common blood, but not always. In any case, if Du Bois was concerned above all with the power of blood, then one would expect the greatest gift of black people in his eyes to be some characteristic behavioral tendency that he isolates and praises. By contrast, what Du Bois actually calls the greatest gift of black people is the way they used political power during the exceptional period of the post-Civil War Reconstruction. Chapter five, The Reconstruction of Freedom was something of a trial run for his masterpiece of historical writing published a little over a decade later, Black Reconstruction in America. In the part of the chapter where he uses the term the greatest gift. He has been discussing the passing of the 15th Am Amendment, which gave the vote to black men. Uh, du Bois describes the passing of the amendment as a necessity in the face of the determination of former secessionists to re-enslave and resubjugate black people as best as they could. Writing, thus Negro suffrage, suffrage was forced to the front, not as a method of humiliating the South, not as a theoretical and dangerous gift to the freedmen, not according to any preconcerted plan, but simply because of the grim necessities of the situation. The North must either give up the fruits of war, keep a Freedmen's Bureau for a generation, or use the Negro vote to reconstruct the Southern states and to ensure such, le such legislation as would at least begin the economic emancipation of the slave. In other words, the North being unable to free the slave, let him try to free himself. And he did. And this was his greatest gift to this nation. Why was this the greatest gift? Note first the framing. Unlike moments where he seems to call passive experiences gifts, this gift is all about black agency. Du Bois describes the 15th Amendment as if it were a moving out of the way by the federal government. The black man is described as responding by freeing himself through the vote, which does not sound like beneficence to others, as we would expect from a great gift, but rather caring for oneself. Black people caring for themselves in this case, though, meant advancing modern civilization, or so Du Bois argues. He provides evidence that state constitutions after the participation of black people in southern state governments during Reconstruction were more democratic in ways that remained the case even after black people were pushed out of the political process in the wake of the end of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow segregationist law. Property qualifications that excluded poor white people were removed by legislatures that included black people and depended upon black votes. The public school system that would benefit coming generations of white Southerners was also pioneered during Reconstruction. Advances of these sorts represent to Du Bois the proof that freedom for black people ultimately means greater freedom for all people. Clearly, this is a gift and clearly it is great. But we must ask once again, what does this mean for thinking about black cultural difference. Reading the gift can make you feel like just about anything can be called a gift, resulting in the worry that it is not essentialism that should cause us concern with Du Bois, but vacuity. 
that we explain by returning to Shelby's critique of, cultural, of black cultural nationalism. Having argued that it is an unhelpful restriction on the freedom of black individuals to require that they embrace a black cultural identity for participation in black solidarity against racism, Shelby considers the objection that the problem can be solved by acknowledging the diversity of black cultures. One could, of course, mean to include under black identity all of the cultural traits that are embraced and reproduced by blacks. This, however, would have the effect of rendering collective identity theory vacuous because blacks cannot help taking on cultural traits of one sort of another, one sort or another, and therefore the imperative to conserve blackness would have no prescriptive force. It would not require blacks to do anything but literally be themselves. Applied to the gift, one might argue that Du Bois makes gift giving everything black people do and even everything they experience and thus he renders the idea of black cultural contributions vacuous and the imperative to preserve black culture circular and meaningless. But maybe we are simply reading the gift wrong. Maybe we are supposed to understand it as only incidentally concerned with black cultural difference and as first and foremost an account of the centrality of black people to American life history and culture. Maybe the word gift in the title is a rhetorical flourish that should not be taken so seriously. And yet it seems to me that Du Bois directly works against allowing us to treat talk of gifts as mere rhetorical flourish by flaunting the paradoxical nature of some of his references to gift giving. In chapter two, he refers to black labor as the gift of labor, one of the greatest that the, that the Negro has made to American nationality. It was in part involuntarily, involuntary, but whether given willingly or not, it was given and America profited by the gift. What are we to make of this? Let us first be explicit about how distasteful it seems to refer to the involuntary labor of slavery as a gift. Slavery was violent coercion, and it is reasonable to hold that there is no such thing as a gift that has been given through the violent coercion of the gift giver by the gift's recipient. Du Bois seems to suggest that America's profit allows us to call this a gift. That is to say that where someone has benefited from the labor of another, especially in cases where this labor has not been performed for the sake of remuneration, we can focus on that unpurchased benefit and call the labor a kind of gift. But we should, of course, reject this. We can and should insist that we move decisively away from talking about gifts when we move away from talking about that which one gives to another by choice with the conscious intention of bringing some benefit into that person's life. Labor performed without remuneration when performed voluntarily to benefit others can reasonably be called a gift. Labor performed without remuneration where that labor has been extracted from the laborer by the threat of force is a kind of dehumanizing exploitation that we should never refer to as a gift. But where does this leave us? Must we view Du Bois as having presented us here with mere gibberish? I think not. I have suggested that we should criticize the move he makes here on a moral basis, but I do think there is a way of reconstructing what he is up to that makes it meaningful, regardless of how advisable it is. Consider this striking sentence from the conclusion of Frantz Fanon's classic existentialist work, Black Skin, White Masks. I am a man and I have to rework the world's past from the very beginning. I am not just responsible for the slave revolt in Saint-Domingue. Every time a man has brought victory to the dignity of the spirit, every time a man has said no to an attempt to enslave his fellow man, I have felt a sense of solidarity with his act. Fanon here is 
pushing in a direction that is, in one sense, the opposite of Du Bois's orientation. He refuses to take special pride in black, ac black, black accomplishments, such as the Haitian Revolution. And he vows to celebrate instead any moment where any human being has surmounted oppression. What is instructive, however, is the way that he speaks of this shift in his thinking from seeing the appeal of black pride to embracing the option of solidarity with all humans as a matter of reworking the past. This, like what we find in Du Bois, is purposefully paradoxical. It sounds like choosing to change the past, while the past, of course, cannot change. It is clear to me, though, that what Fanon is talking about is our freedom to revise our subjective relationship with the past. We do not and cannot choose what the past is in some radical sense that changes the movement of time from forward to backward, but we can, and often do, choose what we want the past to mean to us. Understood in this way, we can read Du Bois as suggesting in the gift that when we look back at the past and see the pain of slavery, there's something empowering about refusing to see it solely as victimization and choosing to see the way in which it built up American wealth as a benefit for which black people ought to be thanked. The idea of gratitude for black labor is dependent upon such a revision of the meaning of slavery. Should we agree with him that gratitude is in order here? I'm not sure we should, but this is a meaningful sentiment, perhaps even a reasonable one, whether or not we ultimately support it. This key to understanding what sense it makes to speak of involuntary gifts also delivers us the key to understanding how the diversity of gifts in the gift can be related to the project of preserving black culture. The decision to revise the meaning of the past is the decision to actively remember something where part of what is active about this process of remembering is the choice of what to value in the past and how. Consider this poetic bit of the book's preface, which Du Bois tellingly calls the prescript. We who know may not forget, but must forever spread the splendid sordid truth that out of the most lowly and persecuted of men, man made America. There are splendid things like music and sordid things like slavery, rape and war, and the splendid stuff emerges out of a sordid context, and thus the sordid in an important sense provides the condition for the splendid. These experiences are thus of complicated value, but what is uncomplicatedly valuable for Du Bois is the choice to remember it all. I think the we in this phrase, while not necessarily exclusively black, is at least primarily black, the collective remembering that he is promoting can thus plausibly be seen as a black cultural practice. To promote such cultivation of collective memory is to promote a socio-historical process that cannot be confused with any biologically essentialist rendering of black cultural activity. Indeed, given the wide variety of things to be remembered, a variety to which future historians will constantly add, the promotion of this cultural practice cannot be confused with the promotion of any constraining prototype of blackness. And yet there is nothing vacuous about the demand that Du Bois is making of black people either. Remembering just anything will not do. Remembering the specific story of black people is the point. So what I would say in conclusion is that I share Du Bois's faith that the black cultural practice of telling and retelling the various stories that make up this larger story contributes profoundly to enlightening and enriching, enlightening and enriching not only the minds and lives of black people, but the minds and lives of all people. 
Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chike. Lots, lots to th think about there and lots to talk about. Um, if you'd like to join in the conversation I'm about to have with Chike, please do put your questions into the chat box. Please try and make them clear and make them fit in to one uh, clear box. But I've got plenty to ask myself. Um, Chike, you get to a, a conclusion in the end. A along the way, there are, there are quite a lot of things that you bring up, which I'm not quite sure what your ultimate take is on them. And they also raise lots of in interesting issues. Uh, but I was, I was just thinking that a lot of the questions I wanted to ask emerged from the fact that to me it seems that a lot of the th things that you're talking about here, about you know essentialism, identity, uh, culture and everything, are kind of topics which, uh, things which apply to more than just the black experience. One could think about them in terms of sure. other forms of identity and culture we have. Um, mm -hmm. is, is that true, or do you think there's something really dis is is there something really distinctive about this this concept of, of blackness, uh, which which makes it different, importantly different to say things like you know Englishness or uh, romanceness, which uh, Du Bois talked about. Mm. Yes, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I do think that the questions brought up. Uh, by Du Bois, uh, explored in this paper, uh, absolutely have, um, in many respects, application beyond the Black experience. Um, I think that uh, that point could, of course, be pushed too far, though, right? <clears throat> if, uh, if we were to simply say, oh, well, everything Du Bois says that I talked about, you can say the same thing for other people X. Well, it actually would be nonsensical, and that is because uh, so much of what Du Bois um, says uh, draws on the very specific history of uh, black people in general, and especially for him, African Americans in particular. Um, and so the lesson that I would take from that is that uh, the point of reading someone like Du Bois philosophically, um, is both to understand how he speaks to issues of culture and politics uh, more generally, right? Uh, themes of culture and politics that are perhaps we could say in some sense universal, uh, but gives his insights uh, with respect to these themes through discussion of the particular culturally unique uh, experiences of black people. And that is the strength of the work, right? Uh, we, yeah, we gain the most by reading Du Bois when we both appreciate how he speaks to uh, human problems more generally, but also how he illuminates those problems through specific discussion of the black experience. I mean, one thing that came out, I mean, perhaps more in Thomas Shelby's critique rather than Du Bois himself, is that we, there's this issue here of how much one should have what you think called cultural nationalism at some point, this kind of sense of the dis distinctiveness as against the idea of the, right. yeah, the melting pot, the, the bringing together. It did seem to me that what, what Shelby did pointed towards this. Um, idea perhaps we have that we, perhaps we we have a, a, a too simplistic idea we think that the choice is uh, diversity and with it division or uh, uniformity and with it unity and this idea that actually you you require a full recognition of the diversity within a community to have that unity and actually ironically the more you push for unity the more you get uniformity the, the more you get division it, it, have i got that point point right and, and, and what, what do you make of that as a line of argument is it something you're persuaded by yes um i think that what you're describing uh, the idea of uh, unity not through uniformity but rather unity that um unity that celebrates itself as unity partly through the celebration of diversity. Uh, I think that that is uh, a nice way to define, you know, multiculturalism, right? So multiculturalism as a 
as an idea, which 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 is of course in in many ways a controversial idea, and uh, which which as a as a Canadian, I sort of take pride that that it's uh, it's it's our fault that the world has to think about this this phrase. It really emerges actually out of uh, Canadian politics in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and we're the first country to enshrine multiculturalism um, as public policy and part of our law. Mm. I think that very idea of uh, multiculturalism is, is again, what you described, right? Uh, refusing the idea that, that there's either diversity and division or unity and, and uniformity. I think that uh, Du Bois uh, was a multiculturalist and, um, and I am definitely very attracted to, very influenced by um, his version uh, of that thought. Um, uh, to speak very briefly to the uh, uh, the mention of Shelby, um, part of how we can see the difference between myself and Shelby um, is that uh, it's not that Shelby thinks that everyone should be doing the same things. Uh, Shelby takes diversity um, in America and the world more generally, but then also among black people. Uh, he takes cultural diversity to to be a fact, to be something to be recognized and to be respected. But um, he takes that fact um, as a reason for cultural identity to be a matter separate from the idea of black solidarity against racism. In other words, he takes it to be the case that if we allow cultural identity to be part of what black solidarity against racism is about, then we're going to have all these disagreements. Um, we're going to have to figure out what black culture is. We're going to have different segments of the community struggling for uh, perhaps to, 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 to suggest that that their vision of black culture is, is, is the real one and, and others are wrong. And he takes it to be sort of a, a, a necessary source of disunity. Uh, and he takes the solution, therefore, to be that, um, uh, you know, enjoy all the various cultural things you want to, both black or otherwise, um, uh, and leave culture sort of out of the question of how we band together as a people to fight against racism. Um, and so, yeah, part of my um, allegiance to Du Bois, we might say, is that I do think that um, that the cultural element of the fight against racism can't be pushed aside and that there are ways of um, overcoming the worries he has about what it means for unity or disunity. I've got some audience questions coming in, which I'm going to come to in a second. But just just one more for me, though. Um, and it's going to relate to this idea of multiculturalism. One, one of the things that uh, one of the more readily comprehensible things Zizek has talked about uh, is this sense in which uh, in ideas of multiculturalism. There's some a kind of a double standard there. Actually, a lot of people who see themselves as being in favour of multiculturalism are multiculturalists from the side of things where they are the people who enjoy all without being attached mm. at all. And actually they kind of secretly look down on people who preserve their own cultural difference. There's a kind of a, because you know what I mean, you're, you're superior because you, you know, you, you embrace all cultures, and but you're parasitic on the people who maintain their individual cultures. At the same time, you kind of look down on them. And I, I wonder if there's a kind of a bind here for uh, people whose cultures are have been oppressed or a minority and so forth that you know mm. by being proud about them and by promoting them they're kind of seen in the mm. eyes of the so-called good liberal multiculturalists as actually you know, not not quite being up to the level of being able to escape their own <laughs> identity and enjoy all uh, does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah so the so if Zizek himself used the word multiculturalism when describing what you're describing, um, it seems to me that cosmopolitan might be a better uh, word. So if we, if we think of the, the cultural cosmopolitan um, 
as a person, all right? Who, who is the cultural cosmopolitan? Well, uh, you know, not only does this person uh, have familiarity with all the various cuisines from around the world that, you know, his or her city can uh, give them access to, but they, oh, but they travel a lot and they, they know, you know, things in different languages and, and things of that nature, right? They're, they're this citizen of the world, right? Uh, I think that's, in some sense, the, the person you were describing, right? And, and, and it is understandable what you mean, the idea that such a person, in a way, um, stands apart from individual cultures, and yet is parasitic upon those cultures. You can only be the person with this wide experience of uh, various world cultures if there are the world cultures for you to have experience with and draw, you know, uh, your eclectic mix in terms of what you happen to play musically and which books you're reading and what you're watching on Netflix. Your ability to sort of sample the world in that way is, of course, uh, by necessity, uh, parasitic on there being these cultures, these long, multi-generational um, <clears throat> units uh, that, that is... Uh, these cultural traditions that have fostered um, various and different approaches to life. Um, what I think that means, uh, first of all, for what it means to, to, to be a good cultural cosmopolitan, um, uh, is that, uh, well, the good cultural cosmopolitan in my mind, is also going to be a good cultural nationalist, right? That is to say, recognizing the very thing that you mentioned, uh, the cultural uh, cosmopolitan should recognize the value of preserving, maintaining, passing on the tradition that fostered uh, him or her, right? Um, and so, so I think the first lesson is that we try to find a balance between um, a certain sense of gratitude for the cultural tradition that uh, brought us into being, or cultural traditions, right? Uh, depending on whether we see them there them uh, as multiple, right? So we 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 have this gratitude for the cultural tradition that that first brought us to the world. We try to conserve and. Uh, uh, bring what is of value um, in that tradition forward, right? promote it, right? pass it on to children, things of this nature. Right? Um, uh, and then, you know, from that perspective, without any guilt, right, we can combine with that uh, the sense of world adventure, right? the sense of, of, of benefiting from all the various... Um, diverse cultural traditions uh, that we can be introduced to through technology, through travel, um, and so on. So I think that, 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 that if, there, if there is a paradox in what you describe, I think that is the solution to the paradox, that, that we see a certain productive tension between the idea of uh, an inward appreciation of your own cultural, cultural tradition and uh, an, an outward interest in the cultural traditions of the entire world, right? Uh, we see a productive tension between that, where if you're, if you're, if you're too inward or if you're too outward, either way, uh, you you would be failing. And and just to to bring back the the term, uh, multiculturalism. <clears throat> so understanding multiculturalism um, as as an approach to social life where we value uh, that a single society in some sense, uh, Canada, the UK, um, or, you know, or a province or a city, right? Um, understanding multiculturalism is the idea of, of, of encouraging and promoting uh, respect for diversity within that single setting, right? Well, then we see how multiculturalism makes 
the kind of balance that I just described possible. That is, multiculturalism affirms you in your uh, decision, desire, mission to preserve your own cultural tradition. And yet, multiculturalism uh, affords you right the uh, the joy of uh, encountering and enjoying these various other cultures uh, that are present in your uh, society. No, thanks very much. I, I just had the thought. I did wonder whether perhaps one reason why perhaps people like myself are sort of grew up with almost the assumption that one shouldn't sort of assert one's own culture too much is a perhaps a, a sense of, of guilt in a way that, um, to, to sort of celebrate to celebrate a kind of a, a white European culture when you know it's been responsible for so much it, it seems that something one should be a little bit um, less keen to shout about. I've got a question here from Victoria Wang um, is it was something right at the end of your talk do you think that Du Bois we that you talked about at the end can allow for including people we'd call allies today um this idea of how do you stand on on this question i thought that we was very interesting at the end actually mm -hmm. yes um if i can briefly say something about uh, your last comment julian um the question of what it would mean as a white european to uh, champion the value of your heritage, so to speak, right? Uh, I understand what you mean in terms of sort of finding that questionable. Um, I hope one thing that, it, that, that would be clear is that uh, the Du Bois would not want you to just uh, sort of try and shrug off that heritage or hide it, right? I mean, even in this talk, you, you have the example of uh, when he brings up Shakespeare, right? And he wouldn't want anyone to think that, well, let's, let's stop pretending that Shakespeare was a great cultural contribution to the world. He'd want to say as, a, as an Englishman, you know, take pride <laughs> that, uh, uh, that this uh, uh, writer who, you know, comes along once in a millennium or whatever, you know, uh, is such a great contribution to world culture, right? Um, so the worry would not be the celebration of white European culture. The worry would be the promotion of white European culture as superior to that of others. And the, the goal of, of multiculturalism and, and an anti-Eurocentric cosmopolitanism would be that we would break down those kinds of privilege and, and disadvantage um, and, and, and see the beauty in all cultures. Um, and to, uh, to Victoria's question, I think that, uh, she has her finger on, um, what I, what I want to say. Uh, I think, I think without, uh, me being very explicit, um, I think she's, she's captured something like, like my understanding of that we, that is to say, uh, I take Du Bois to, by that we first, ex first of all, um, express um, the notion of a black we, uh, the notion of, you know, we are the ones who have experienced this and we must remember this. We can't forget what we've gone through. And of course, that functionally means um, we need historians to be setting down uh, this, uh, this material. We need to preserve our heritage and our history, right? And that, that I think, is the sense in which it is a black we. Um, uh, and yet, right, um, I do think the sentence can be read in a way uh, where nothing contradictory nothing confusing would arise from imagining that the we who know would be all who know the story right uh and in that regard um if i'm right to say that he is talking primarily about a black we, and that he is encouraging a specifically uh black project of the preservation of black history um, I do think that it is also a phrase that uh, 
that captures allyship, that captures the idea that uh, there's a there's a collective, a, a human collective re uh, responsibility uh, to capture what's meaningful in these stories and, and to um, promote that and to share that wisdom. Thanks very much. There's another, uh, I, should, I often say actually in these things that because of the not fully interactive nature of this experience, when we put up a question, perhaps uh, we sometimes have to take it as a springboard to, to take it in whichever way we think is most fruitful. We can't necessarily know exactly what the person is asking. So um, I think this is perhaps up to this one. I thought this is an interesting thought by the compiler. Um, people also go by interesting names on this. Um, I said, I found the gift wording to mean that, like, while Americans are okay to violently exploit black Americans as if it were a gift, they're often hesitant to accept genuine cultural gifts of black culture. And I suppose, now that might sound like it's a bit of interpretation of what Du Bois meant or did not mean, so whether or not that's what Du Bois meant, is there something in that which you think um, is uh, something, something in this observation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, th I think I think there is something in the observation. Um, certainly, part of the point of the book um, is to open uh, white American eyes to that which they have taken for granted in terms of the importance of Black people in um, shaping the history, public life culture um, the, the existence of the country as a whole um, and um, not sure if this is what the questioner had in mind but there's a you know there's a, a paradox that can that can come about sometimes where you have um, someone who uh, is uh, happy to have gained, um, I don't know, let's say, like, like, like their, some of their favorite songs are from, you know, Motown or, you know, uh, they have, uh, you know, really enjoyed some of the movies that uh, Denzel Washington or Will Smith has, ha, um, has been in. And, um, and yet you see this attitude of, of disregard toward, toward black people that, uh, that comes out, and so there's an interesting paradox that you can have here, where where the cultural contributions of um, a people can be sort of uh, just taken for granted and valued um, uh, through through consumption, um, while um, various forms of uh, prejudice um, live alongside that enjoyment. I mean, you know, to take a to take a simpler example, right? You could be, you know, um, like a, a a Trump loving xenophobe who who wants the Mexicans to get out of your country, but but you don't mind a good taco or something like that, right? Um, the you know you can think about that kind of um, paradox, um, and yeah, I think that what we what we get from Du Bois um, is that. Uh, the proper way to turn such a person around, if it is possible to turn them around, is to get them to have a wider historical view um, through which they can begin to start understanding just how much these people that they disdain um, have given them the life that they have uh, because of how foundational culturally these people are to the world in which they live. I've got a little preamble to a question from the uh, audience. Uh, uh, earlier on in the talk when you were speaking quite a lot about what's problematic about the concept of race, and in particular how Du Bois pointed out that, you know, scientists couldn't really find there's nothing scientific basis for this concept at all. And therefore we had to think of it as like sociological and, and historical. I, I wonder then why then we don't just simply do away with the term race altogether and think instead just of, of cultures and everything. So why any merit in keeping that term race at all, given its problematic uh, issues? Well, I think that's a good question. And, um, and I think that there are 
aspects of the essay that I was discussing at that point, the conservation of races, uh, that could maybe be used to push in the direction that you're pushing. So I mentioned the idiosyncratic uh, list of races that he has, right? That he refers to the black race, um, but he also refers to the English, the Germans, the uh, Romance nations, um, he also refers to, if I can remember the other four, the Slavs, uh, the Hindus, the Mongols or Mongolians, or, um, I am forgetting. Oh, Jews, maybe the Jews too. Anyway, so I'm, can't, I'm not remembering exactly his, his, his list of the, the eight great world races. Um, when he is uh making that list right he is sort of uh, it's it's clear that he's talking about race in in this historical and social sense right whereas earlier when talking about natural science he makes reference to there being well you know there's there's black white is there any others maybe the yellow right like so so so, he, so there's like two maybe three from the perspective of natural science um and and at least eight great nation uh, eight great races and he uh, he does actually use the word nations at times interchangeably once he's sort of uh, set this up um, races or nations or or families um, anyway all of this can sort of maybe lead us a bit in in the direction of um, of what you say well why don't why don't we just call them cultures um, I think that what we uh, gain from the conservation of races um, has to be understood as has to be understood as about race uh, and not about something else, um, particularly because of the the focus on the black race, right? Because that is, I mean, he himself acknowledges the sort of cultural cultural variety, right, from from Africa to uh, the, the various peoples throughout the Americas that would be covered under under this term, the Negro race is, of course, what he says rather than the black race. Right? Um, the point is that uh, we'd be we wouldn't be specific enough if we simply refer to this as a culture or as an ethnicity, right? We have various ethnicities that uh, make up the black race, we might say, um, and, and even that's maybe not the, the best way to put it because you have what you have, what we might call an ethnicity or certain um, ethnicities. I'm thinking of if we think of Latin American uh, as, a, as an ethnicity or if we think of Arab as an ethnicity, uh, then we actually have sort of cross-cutting racial and ethnic lines here because to be ethnically Latino um, uh, means potentially being black racially, but then again, you might not be. And there's, you know, the, you know, there are uh, black Arab, black people who, who, who ethnically understand themselves as Arab, like say, for example, in Sudan. Um, uh, it remains the case that um, race, refers to this broad division of the world, uh, partly through appearance, right? Uh, but then appearance as related to ancestry and specifically ancestry within a certain geographical region, right? So sub-Saharan Africa, therefore being the homeland of the black race, uh, uh, Europe being the home of the white race, you know, uh, th then you could bring in East Asia, uh, then you could talk about the indigenous peoples of the Americas, uh, and so on and so on. Um, so, so that kind of broad division of the world, um, which, which that very division became um, more obvious, in a way, or not obvious, that's not the word I want to use, but became of importance as people understood who actually was in the world 
and they came to understand who actually was in the world, partly through voyages of exploration and conquest, right? And so within the process by which Europe comes to achieve a certain dominance um, in the modern era through colonization, there's this question of how we make sense of the world's diversity, right? And, and that's what gives us racial identities um, uh, and those racial identities uh, uh, can have these these cultural components, right? And I follow Du Bois in seeing their uh, in seeing blackness in particular to be a, a racial identity with which I feel culturally uh, 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 through which I feel culturally uh, uh, situated. Um, so we wouldn't want to just um, pretend that that this is one culture among others. I mean, so that this is just any kind of culture. It's specifically a racial culture, just as we could talk about national cultures, right? So we could make the difference between, you know, uh, I mean, because within uh, countries, I mean, say the UK, right? We could talk about um, the difference between uh, we can talk about the difference of uh, of dialects between different parts of England. Let's let's not even talk about outside of England for now, right? You know, we could talk about different dialects outside of England, but then we could raise up a level and then see sort of English culture, right? So there's going to be regional cultures, national cultures. There are going to be different kinds of cultures. I think that what uh, Du Bois leads us to reflect on is the idea of racial cultures. Okay, because so this did sort of lead into a question from uh, John Collegio, who's one of our regular viewers. And uh, I think the, the, the idea he's asking about, you know, different, he's suggesting that different cultures exist when there's exclusion or different values, and do both now apply? And what are back values apart from not being repressed white people? And I guess maybe, you know, um, forgive me, John, if, I'm, if this is taking this in the wrong direction, but I guess the broader question here is... Um, it, 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 it are, is the, is sort of the, the category of of black now? Uh, is it doing is it doing work anymore? Given how much mm. is is changed, and is, is there is there any real unity to this to this anymore? You know, we talk about the, the black experience, and certainly mm. there are things I think probably people do all experience in virtue of simply having a, a skin color. I'm not not denying that, but given that there's so much of the experience which is different depending on socioeconomic class, sure. which country they're in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, Du Bois was speaking you know, quite a lot a while ago now. I mean, do you, do you think we're, we, it's still going to be important and necessary to, to think about black as a distinctive mm. sort of like race uh, now and going forward? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I would say yes, this is my answer. Um, I think that the question, um, you know, thoughtfully uh, differentiated between um, different ways in which uh, a population, let's put it that way, uh, can be made culturally distinct. So the question suggested that one way that a, a, a population can be made culturally distinct is exclusion. If they have to sort of interact only among themselves and are excluded from a larger society, right? there's going to be something culturally variable about that experience. The question also suggested that um, another way in which a population could be culturally distinct is because there are certain values um, that they hold on to uh, and they uh, seek to keep holding on to those values, um, whether or not they're excluded. They may be in many ways integrated socially, but, but, but remain somewhat distinct through, through holding on to distinctive values, right? And before coming back to black people, you can sort of see how um, one might think of uh, the Jewish experience in these terms, right? So, um, at various points in European history, 
um, Jewish peoples uh, while speaking the language of the country that they're in, um, you know, have nevertheless uh, experienced various forms of exclusion, various forms of ghettoization, and then, uh, of course, the uh, the ultimate form of exclusion, uh, the genocidal form of exclusion uh, that um, that took place during uh, the Second World War. Right? But then you could also think, on the other hand, about the idea of um, certain of carrying on certain values, right? Whether those be uh, certain religious values, and what it what it means to uh, carry on Jewish identity as a religious uh, sort of um, identity informed by uh, particular religious texts. Uh, but we could also, of course, say that there are people who uh, are ethnically Jewish who uh, are not religious and perhaps atheists, and yet also still take pride in what it means uh, to be Jewish. Right? And, you know, I've gone through this in the case of Jewish people because I think it can be instructive for understanding how Du Bois and myself are understanding this with, re with regard to black people. Um, exclusion has been one of the ways that black people have... Um, have been kept distinct, but it is the way that we want to overcome. It is the kind of difference-making force that uh, that we hope to uh, finally and utterly destroy. Right? And we can certainly, in line with what you were saying, Julian, talk about right how perhaps some of the forms of exclusion that were still in place at the time that Du Bois is writing was writing that book. Right, that things are, we could say, better now uh, with regard to that. Right, But I do think that Du Bois, um, and I, I think, not only do I think, I think it's made very clear in an essay from 1960 called Whither Now and Why. I think Du Bois clearly wanted uh, black community, black cultural community, right, to persist right, through a sense of shared values and not a sense of shared values that would relate to, say, some one religious tradition, right, but, 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 but a sense of um, shared values where what is first and, force, first and foremost important in terms of a shared value is the idea of valuing the history, right? This is where I ended uh, the paper, right, that you're already engaging in a particular form of black culture by, as a black person, um, finding it important to introduce your, your black children to um, the various historical figures, right? Um, that, that in and of itself is a kind of shared value, as the question put it, that is not simply about wanting to be unoppressed, right? It, part of the, 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 the way that, that this uh, cultural unity can continue past the point of exclusion uh, is that the history during which the exclusion was going on, right, produced um, thinkers like Du Bois, uh, you know, musicians, uh, like Billie Holiday, uh, you know, various cultural forms that you can then continue to value even if we reach the goal of you being no longer excluded. Okay, we are running over time, but I just wanted one final quick question. Perhaps if you try and give a, a brief answer to it. It's just that sure. given our theme is expanding horizons, it did strike me there was one thing perhaps in this talk which, which, which made us think perhaps more generally about how we do philosophy. And this is this, that Philosophers, I think, generally, historically, in the English-speaking world of thought, their job is to, and they use this phrase, carve nature at the joints. So it's making conceptual di distinctions and making categories mm. in a way that I mm. think they understood to be kind of uh, value-neutral, as it were. We're just trying to describe as accurately as possible. And it did strike me that actually a lot of what your talk is illustrating is that if we're asking what the right distinctions are to make, the right categories to put people in, 
we have to think actually about what the effects of those categories are on the lives of people in the world. It's not a neutral enterprise. Is, is that is that have I got that right? Uh, yes, you absolutely have that right. Um, uh, viewers who found this talk interesting, they might wish to read the book that you mentioned, uh, What is Race? Uh, for Philosophical Views. And uh, in that book, I uh, defend what I call a cultural constructionist approach to race. Um, but I make a point uh, in one of the chapters of mine in that book where I say, well, well, if you really want to, to keep ethics and metaphysics very separate, if you really want to keep the question of what, what there is very, very separate from the question of what we should value, right? then, then at a certain point you shouldn't call me um, a cultural constructionist. You should just call me a social constructionist because I understand race to involve um, how uh, different appearances on the basis of different ancestries leading back to different places of origin um, are made socially significant. Um, but I argue that when we think of, uh, when we expand our view to, to include the question of well, what, what should we value, right, then the point that I was just making in response to the previous question comes up. That is to say, uh, one of the ways that um, people are understand themselves as different socially on the basis of appearance and origin, right, is the, the, the political uh, sense, the, the, the sense of different uh, forms of power, right? And we uh, have been placed in various hierarchies uh, on the basis of race. And that's a kind of social differentiation, which it should be our goal to get rid of, to be done with. Uh, but if it is true, as Du Bois and I would believe, that compatible with that is maintaining a sense of distinctive identity, say, for example, black identity, where it is no longer a matter of a position in a hierarchy, but rather a unique heritage culturally appreciated uh, by those w within the group, uh, then that's what makes me a cultural constructionist. Uh, so yes, I do think that uh, what you say is very true about about method. Okay, look, thanks very much. We have run over. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. Um, uh, we run over because there's so much to talk about, so much we could have talked about, lots of really interesting issues raised there. Um, I won't give you the, the adverts for talks to come. Have a look online, sign up to our mailing list, follow us on Twitter and Facebook if you want to know more. And remember that all these talks are available to view uh, at your leisure on our YouTube channel. But for this evening, just uh, thank you for those who joined us live and thank you so much, Chike Jeffers, really stimulating talk.